Tony, our subject is the jail, and as you may know that the jail, the Oklahoma County Jail, has been really a, a scandal of sorts for many years. It was built for 1,200 inmates, and last year, maybe the year before, the, the count was exceeded 2,500. In 2015, 27% of the admissions were women. Uh, now there was talk of building a new jail, uh, floating a bond, uh, financing this, and people stepped back and the chamber stepped back and said, wait, whoa, w wait a minute, let's step back and, and look at this a little more broadly. But, uh, and so the task force was created and you decided to be a part of the leadership of that task force. So I wanted to ask first, I'm sure there was a lot of fact finding and they came to you and started laying out for you this, this picture of what's going on in the jail and I wondered what your reaction was when the facts started coming in. Great question, David. Yeah, it was startling. Uh, frustrating, disappointing. Uh, it is something, and, and we recognize this and, and admit this, it's something as a community and as a business community we had been avoiding for way too long. This has been a problem. It had been brought to our attention lots of times and, and it was just, it was easy to ignore. You look the other direction, you hope everybody who's in there are the bad guys and, and so uh, um, you, you just turn a blind eye to it. Fortunately, the Department of Justice uh, pointed out that uh, we were uh, grievous, uh, egregious, and we needed to make some changes. And there was a realization when they brought, you know, you need a new jail, uh, that we stepped back and, and, and our leadership said, that may not be the answer. And so they brought us this data. Uh, we did bring in Vera to study this, and, and they brought us the data of things that we were doing wrong. And so the cool thing that happened before we even finished our study, the task force study, changes started happening uh, just on their own, their own recognition of things that they could do differently and uh, uh, made lots of headway before the report was ever published last December. Did, um, so people would ask, why, why is the chamber, why is the business community so interested in overcrowding in the jail? What, what would motivate the uh, business leaders to get so involved? There's lots of factors there, uh, and the root of it is, is what we discovered here earlier, the passionate conversation that, that occurred earlier. It's about the people. You know, people of Oklahoma, um, we're amazing. We care about each other. It, it was revealed to the, to the world, uh, unfortunately, back in 1995, and we're great people. And I think there was a, a, a finally a realization that we weren't bringing the entire community along and uh, there was a group of our population that, that, that weren't being brought along with the, the progress that the city had been making for so long. There's, uh, there's economic reasons that we can continue to talk about and why that's important, but the, the, the truth of it is, it, it was, it's the people. Well, do, you, do you think that a condition of a jail or, or its tendency to incarcerate so many people would affect economic development for a city? Sure. Um, when somebody's in jail, it, it, people understand the math, when somebody's in jail, it costs us to have them in there. Uh, and then they're also unable to provide for their family. So there's a, a dual-edged sword there, that, yeah, of almost punishment, if you will, to your wallet. We're paying for somebody to be incarcerated and they're not contributing monetarily to the society. It even stems further, how bad are we hurting their, their family? Uh, and that has additional negative financial repercussions, uh, emotional as well. So, so why, uh, they ask you to be involved, why choose to, I'm sure you're involved in many organizations, civic groups, why did you want to become a part of this task force? When Mr. Bennett asks you to do something, you usually do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Clay Bennett, in case, for those of you who may not know. Um, yeah. Education is very important to me. And um, a friend of mine who is a professor at the University of Oklahoma, he's written a book about the incarceration uh, system in Oklahoma, uh, our jail system, uh, uh, a country called prison. And it's, uh, it's fascinating. And so he got me understanding that part of the challenges with our, our incarceration problems are the educational system. And so I saw this as an opportunity to grow my knowledge and maybe help the whole bigger picture of how we make uh, changes. I'm curious, were, were there any personal reasons? Do you have any family, friends, colleagues, employees who've had experiences with the jail or the justice system in Oklahoma? Yes. Um, the, you know, 77%, uh, there's a study that says 77% of the Oklahoma population 
uh, is affected by somebody being in prison, jail, uh, county, or whatever. And so it's recently uh, had a coworker who uh, made some bad choices and was, was, was pulled over and, um, uh, in, in part of our state and wound up having to have to go to jail over the weekend and got severely in debt because of that. We kept the person employed, a uh, great person, great uh, parent, um, and so we saw an opportunity to help this person. But I think had we not been there as a company to give this person that support, they would have been driven down into to a further depths of society of debt and lots of other things. They're having trouble recovering as it is, even with our help. Um, we employ people who have been um, in jail, felons, and uh, it's, thank you. They're good people. We all make bad choices. People who make bad choices, all of us, we have the right to try and fix those things. We have the right to try and learn from those things. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, and so we've got to start giving people these chances. There are people who need to be in jail, without question. But there's not as many that should be in there that are in there now. Um, there are a lot of different um, sort of agents and groups involved in this task force. You had prosecutors and uh, people from the justice system, uh, civic leaders, uh, and then of course the public in general. Um, there, there's naturally a lot of tension in the justice system for deciding policy. So did any of that tension come to the fore in trying to come up with recommendations or make that final vote on what to do? Yes. Who was fighting? <laughs> <laughs> we saw a little bit of it earlier in the discussion of when you bring people to the table, um, they are passionate about their beliefs. But when you, you bring people, you bring data, uh, you bring your feelings, you bring your care, and, um, you're able to talk about the hard things and you come up with solutions. And I, we don't do a lot of that. I, I, uh, we can blame the technological world that we have out there today or whatever, but we don't have human interaction. And if I've got a problem with you, I need to come to you and I need to try and address it when you try and work it out. I don't think we're doing enough of that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that this conversation started. The chamber didn't set out to fix the criminal justice system. They set out to think, uh, to study if there was a better way to fix uh, our, our county jail system. Um, fortunately, the, the state of Oklahoma jumped on, Tulsa County jumped on, and there's lots of people trying to make big changes, and it's very exciting. There were uh, a number of recommendations that came out of the lengthy report issued from the task force, and uh, those range from finding alternative uh, sentencing strategies, uh, mental health, substance abuse, trying uh, not to find a way not to put people in jail for, say, failure to pay fines and fees and for committing low level municipal offenses. Um, did anything in those findings or in those recommendations strike you as something that would be particularly effective? Several things, uh, but the one the one thing that I want to point out, I think, is is uh, important, is the advisory council that's going to come out of that study, and we're going to set up. Uh, it's an interlocal agreement between the county and multiple cities, to uh, that still needs to be okayed by the attorney general. Uh, but once that's okayed, it's going to be uh, it's going to have a staff, and it's going to be able to watch over this system. Part of the problems that have occurred is things are done in silos. And I think most of it is all unintentional, but when you get those silos together and you have some oversight over it and, and kind of make sure everybody uh, continues to play well together, um, it's some, we don't lose fact that, uh, we don't lose sight of it, it's about the people instead of just executing laws. I wanted to ask you too about um, the stations uh, your company has, radio and television, um, serve some minority communities. So did you, how did you think, um, how important are these changes for, for those communities? Uh, great question. I, I think it's important for everybody, um, and, and um, the Hispanics, the African Americans, women, men, we have to understand we're putting too many people in jail, and, and so it's gonna affect uh, all races, men and women, and that's good, that's gonna come out of this. 
And so, yes, there will be great benefits to the Hispanic community in which we serve, but those benefits are going to be recognized all across the board, and that's important. Um, is uh, how much uh, do you think that uh, incarceration of, of men and women? Uh, do you think that you were looking mainly at the jail level, of course, but uh, at the state level, Oklahoma County still tends to send a lot of uh, inmates, a lot of people to to, the, to our prisons. So, what's your hope about this process and how that might uh, play out uh, at the state level? It's exciting to see everybody engaged on this conversation. And I think if we all recognize the challenge, and I think that's happening, that there's going to be benefits at the state level. As we, we saw earlier, the benefits at the Tulsa County already. We've, got, we've gone from 2,600 people in the jail uh, in the last year down to 2,000. Um, and that's awesome. Uh, Judge Trong uh, and some of our local judges are, are energetic and passionate. They're going down on evenings and weekends and letting people out of jail. You know, you, you're not supposed to be here. And they're letting people out on their own reconnaissance. And, and it's just, it's so cool. So I think we need to recognize at the local level and at the state level, change is necessary. And we do want to make the best change. We want to make the right decision. But, but we just need to change. And it might be a mistake, but if we do our best, we're gonna learn from it. And then let's change some more, and let's change some more. This is a process. Um, we're 1907, we're 110 years old. It took us that long to get here. It's gonna take us a little time to get out of it. We're not gonna fix it from next February to May. So, but let's try. Before I uh, take any audience questions, I wanted to ask, so what's the follow-up? Will a business community, um, remain involved in trying to stop jailing so many people in Oklahoma County? Yes, uh, this is uh, something that is of interest. The chamber will say, stay involved. This advisory council that uh, is being put together is gonna have involvement from the chamber. Uh, it's very necessary that this is an ongoing uh, entity um, and a forever entity, and the business community is very engaged in this. Um, you know, some of the economic things that we need to point out is, employment um, you know we've had such a great run here in Oklahoma City with the passage of the maps tack it's been such a transformational uh, thing that we've done for ourselves and uh, we're realizing that that the, the talent pool we haven't brought everybody along like I said earlier and so we've got to better educate our people and that doesn't just mean in school we've got to we've got to it's life skills and all kinds of things that, we, that we've left behind yes we're gonna stay involved any questions for Tony? There's one. Okay. Uh, my name is Lindsay Canale, and um, I'm just a community enthusiast. <laughs> um, how can the business community lead the way in employment? of convicted people, um, for instance, banning the box, doing things like that that will allow and give people opportunities to actually gain employment after being incarcerated? Great question and great. For, thank you for being a community enthusiast. We need people like you doing that. Absolutely. We have to recognize that being a felon isn't a reason to throw you out. Uh, that's not acceptable, um, and it took us a while to understand that, and I'm glad that we have recognized that, and we need to keep pushing that movement. Um, uh, you know, so many people have had to go to or have chosen to go to the online employment application, uh, and I know you got to have filters, but I want to I want to get to know you. I want to know who you are. I want to know what you do, who your family is. Uh, are you financially secure? If you're not, how can I help you? If you're not good at home or you're not good, your bank account's not very good, you're not going to be that good at work either. So um, we try very hard to get to know our coworkers and, and help them through their challenges because if they're happy at home, they're happy at work. We don't want them escaping at home to come to work. Um, and so, yes, there are things that we can do. I, I will add to that. We need to be taught, too. We need to know what those things are. Um, we, a plumber sets out to plumb. 
he doesn't necessarily or she doesn't necessarily know how to run a business and so we we need help too being taught how to uh, remove those barriers great question thank you question in back good afternoon my name is jessalyn head i'm the coo of the coltrane group i think also that privatization is a major issue within our justice system and the inequity amongst people who are poor, who cannot afford to get a ritzy lawyer to get them off, and other effects that have occurred. I wonder if the chambers of commerce who seem to come from a more conservative viewpoint, they're known for that, but not necessarily is that always the case. But if they could talk with some of the private owners of these prisons, trying to encourage them to approach a more intervention-oriented system, something that is more programmatically focused for those incarcerated, at minimally, those women, first-time offenders, mothers of younger children with, it's, it's sure. a me, multi-faceted issue, I know that. Well, this, the question seems to be. But it seems as if, if we could talk with the private owners to encourage them to have a more compassionate view and programming that is geared towards correcting and addressing those issues that face many of these women, that is more prevention oriented against recidivism, that is more focused on behavior adjustment. Sure, sure. sure. Well, I think, it, absolutely. I think we also need to step back though and say, what have we asked them to do? All we've asked them to do is to jail people and feed them and not treat them inhumanely. So, you know, we've, we've got to be careful to, to, if that's what we want to do, we've got to realize what we have asked them to do. Um, the system is broken. And so when the DA has to come up with half his budget through fines and court costs, and that's a problem. Um, and and that, that list just goes on and on and on and on. And so I think it, it does wind up with the correctional system. It's privatized or it's state run. Um, I, we have to be careful to throw stones at that private business. We've asked them to do a job. We've given them the opportunity and so and they've come to the table and, and yes, they have to make money so that they can feed their families and feed their employees' families and things like that. Profit isn't a bad word. Gross profit, we can debate that. But So we have to recognize that they aren't necessarily the, the bad person here, but we do need to continue to have that dialogue on how to do this better. I would like to follow up with one question. You're in the media business. Do you think the media should be doing anything differently in its coverage of the jail issues and criminal justice and female incarceration? Your stations. I think I we I think we can do a better job. I think our community uh, news uh, f stations has done a fantastic job trying to dig into this and uncover this. Your organization, the Oklahoman, um, can we do more? Sure, we can do more. We have some some challenges in doing that with how people want to consume their data and whether they want to pay for it or not. But yes, we all need to do, and we all need to. So part of the one of the task force that came out of this, or one of the subcommittees that came out of this, is we're trying to go evangelize this to the people who don't know. And so not only does the media need to talk about it, but it needs to be talked about at the water cooler too. So we all need to take what we're learning and tell more people about it that we've got a problem. Do you think coverage is too exploitative at times? Of crime and jailing, or do you think? I, I think for the most part, recently, it's all been, mostly been well-intentioned. I do think sometimes there is that um, overemphasizing of those things, but I really feel like they've tried to do a good job here recently. One last question. Wendelbo with the OU College of Public Health. 
I wanted to follow up on your map statement. It seems like there's a disconnect between uh, conservative or Republican values about saying uh, categorically no new taxes, but then recently uh, in Oklahoma County, Oklahoma City, we just passed a bunch of uh, measures in the state election that said we're willing to tax ourselves because we see some problems. For, you know, this round was in the infrastructure, but it seems like um, the population sees there's a problem, that money's a problem, and we're willing to do something about it. What's the business's angle on uh, what I perceive as a disconnect? I try and look at things that aren't Democratic or Republican. I try not to look at things where we have to separate ourselves. I have a personal belief that the people in Oklahoma have a 90x percent agreement on things. And I would love for us to start our conversation about fixing anything with that 90% of things that we agree upon, 95, 96% of things we agree upon. Let's fix those things. We don't have to ignore the things that we disagree on, but we want to start there and never come to an agreement. We could fix so much and, and then sort out these challenges but instead, we want, to, we want to start here and not do anything. Thank you for your time. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. <laughs> David, great Thank job. You.